Dear Rockstar, you are going to be so psyched that you're here with us today. I'm psyched, but I get to be here with my friend Debbie. Debbie, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Debbie Farah from Bajalia. And for those of people that have never heard of Bajalia, tell us a little bit about Bajalia. Certainly. We are a fair trade wholesale and retailer of products that are developed to create economic development in some of the most difficult economies in the world. They're emerging economies, but places where it's the most difficult to be a woman. Wow. Okay, so talk to me about when you started. Like, how did Bajalia start? You know, I had no intention of starting Bajalia. I loved my career. I was in uh, high-end fashion and advertising and was having a great time, but started to hit my 40s and thought, you know, it's time to give back. So began thinking of ways to give back and I got asked to go and be a photographer internationally on a trip that would document some uh, social good and social work that this nonprofit was doing. So I said yes and I went on this, um, went on this trip and began just kind of looking through my camera mm. and that really isolates stories it isolates the story of each and every woman differently than I had ever seen it before. And poverty didn't become this, you know, overwhelming global issue. It became Mina's issue and Rabina's issue and Seema's issue. And I looked at how mothers were wiping dust off a dirt floor for their children to have a place to sleep. Yeah. They didn't have indoor, you know, they didn't have an indoor way to live. They were just, I just was faced with abject poverty for the first time in my life. Whereabouts did you go on that photography? My that very first trip was Mombasa, Kenya. And Mombasa is an interesting place because it's a culture clash between the African culture and Arab culture and the Indian culture because it's right over the Indian Ocean. Wow. And so, and the Arabian Sea. So it's just across the sea from India. So a lot of Indians um, had settled there from coming from India, trying to get into Kenya. And so it was a real interesting place. Multicultural. Uh, Very mix. multicultural. It just resonated, me being Middle Eastern, it resonated with my Middle Eastern self, but resonated with, you know, what I knew of Africa. And then being exposed to the Indian culture was new to me at the time. And so all of those things just together, I was just fascinated wow. by not only the culture mixing, but um, you know, a little petrified of how women were treated, horrified. It was just like the things that were happening to women in some of these cultures, even though I knew it, I myself was a product of violence um, when I was young and I knew these things happened but I did not know um, how easy it would be to solve if we could put money in women's hands so women could have a voice. Wow. So, so I, you go over on this trip and you've got this job. So when you come back? I was kind of ruined. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, the first thing I did, obviously, was um, I was... I went on a two-week trip, I came home, I had these great photographs, I did a couple of photography shows, I talked about the people that I met, um, never really anticipating anything would happen except that I, I got asked, uh, my photography was, was so um, resonated with so many people that I got asked to go on a second trip. So at the beginning, all I thought was, oh, I'm going to document these stories. So I kind of did the photojournalism thing or volunteerism. And I went to the next place. Which was? And that was India. And then I went to a third place, which was uh, China. And then I went to Thailand. And so for a couple of years, several years, um, I kept going overseas for two and three weeks at a time. I was single. I had a lot of vacation. I was able to use my vacation and, and do this. The whole time, I began to then research economic development and the things that were tugging at my heartstrings. Which were? Which were um, how to create jobs for women in a developing world. Okay. How women can get a voice in a place where the culture is against them. How little girls could get in school when their brothers are always chosen over them. 
Um, a lot of places that I work now, there's a problem when girls hit puberty because there might only be one school in the village. And if you're going to choose who's going to go to school, it's always your son's. And so there's a Chinese proverb that says educating your daughter is like watering your neighbor's garden. Mm. So there's not a desire to educate young girls. But when a mom works, everything changes. Little girls are educated for the first time. Wow. Moms actually become the driving force to keep their daughters in school. When they actually have enough money to educate both of their children and not have to choose. So that's some of the impact you're seeing from your work. So you went for a couple years to these photojournalists, and then what? Well, then I started uh, stopping by the embassy when I was in town. <laughs> <Just> stopping by. <laughs> your American passport gets you pretty far. So I just decided I wanted to go to the embassy one day and start talking to the people there to find out if there were any projects I could look at to, that were really successful. Because I started getting curious. I started thinking, well, why hasn't anyone done this? Right. You know, why hasn't anyone really created the kind of businesses that could make long-term systematic change? Right. And so I started, uh, took my little passport into the embassy and, and got appointments pretty quickly with people that are dying to talk to Americans. That's what they're there for. They're there to help us when we're in the country. And I began sharing my heart for women, and I began talking to the people that were head of the Economic Development Task Force and people that were in charge of gender situations and people that were in charge of girls' education. And once you meet one person, it's really easy to meet the others. They um, introduced me to some projects that were successful, but what I saw was projects weren't scaling well. Projects really were projects. Right. They weren't. They a one time. They weren't sustainable business models. Right. And I couldn't figure out why. I've done business most of my life, most of it in the product advertising or fashion world. And most of my experience has been either in luxury goods or consumer goods in some way or shape. And I just kept really getting confused as to why this hadn't been done. It seemed simple enough. In your head, it was you were starting. To, you saw the model that seemed simple, or you started to assume I, that. I thought I saw the model. Um, I didn't think it included me. <laughs> so how did that, <laughs> that was start? a surprise. Where, where did that start? Well, um, as I started asking questions, I started realizing that most of the people, when I went and visited projects, they were amazing people. They were missionaries. They were um, nuns. They were pastors' wives. They were Peace Corps workers. They were. Someone that went on a vacation and saw a need and decided to stay and help Step people. Up. So there were some amazing people that stepped up to the plate to do this. But what I found, there weren't very many business people out there. Okay, so There weren't people with relevant business experience. And that's what I brought to the table that I found no one else I met brought to the table. So then what did you start first? So the first thing I did um, was it, it about four years or three and a half years into this traveling, I started raising money for these trips so I could go on more of them. And I started raising that money. I founded a nonprofit and started raising money through the nonprofit, started having events. I started bringing product over and just selling it to my friends and used that money to raise the money for my next trip and my next research trip. Okay. And the trips then became a little bit longer. They became research trips. It still wasn't something, it, the nonprofit was something I was going to start and do for several years before we launched a for-profit or to look and see even if a for-profit model was viable. So that's what I did at first. Mm -hmm. I, I a lot of research and even on the internet research and talking to people that had done some work in this area talking to people that were doing production and importing things from around the world. There were a lot of pieces and parts to my thought process that I didn't have the skill set for at the time. Right. So I had to do a lot of research. A lot of research. And then when the for-profit came, how did that come to the world? Or well, the for-profit came out of necessity. We knew, I knew from day one, as soon as I figured out the business model, I would launch a for-profit. It came a little more quickly than I wanted it to mostly because the 2008-9 crisis hit. So we were running a sustainable nonprofit. That basically means every single year, our nonprofit would um, 
make more than the year before. Okay. So the very first year we were, you know, 90% donations and 10% sale of goods. That changed every year. So about four years in, we were about 60% um, sale of goods and 40% donations. Right. And so we were in pretty good shape in generating income to run the nonprofit. And talk to us a little. So the the first places that women were making that you were bringing in? Um, Kenya and India. So okay. Africa and India were our first two places we began to work. And how many women were you working with? You know, when I first saw this, I thought I'd work with six women in a village in India. It went very, very quickly because everyone needed so much help. So we went from you know, one village to 20 or 30 pretty fast, and then Kenya. And how and does that work in a village? Like when you go in and started a village, what, what does that look like? You know, so the, every single one of our villages looks a little different right? because that's how things work around the world. Every personality that's running something is running it a little differently. On our part, the things that always stay the same are we typically have to have someone on the field that's in charge someone that can either speak English or communicate on a computer or Skype with us or something like that. I'll tell you today, I'm 15 years in, or 14 years in, today it looks very different than it looked then. How many artisans do you work with, women around the world? We approximately have a workforce of about 200,000 artisans now. 200,000? We don't work with everyone every day. Um, but we're working in 28 countries now with about 200,000 artisans. In just one, one of our groups in India boasts 2,000 artisans just for that group. Wow. And so talk to us about the model, how it works. What does the artisan get? What does Bajalia get? Talk so to us So we are not a nonprofit. We are a for-profit. We strongly believe in capitalism. That's the only thing that's going to change anything. So and why we do, you believe do not... That? Why do you believe that? Well, for one thing, in my own family, my life has changed. I have a grandmother who was married at 14, a mother who was married at 16. I was, um, got my first job at 14, but my first marriage proposal at 15. So I know for a fact that when I got a job, it changed the trajectory of my life. So I know change is possible because it happened to me. When I women have, have money, been, things change. Things change. And you, when, I was, when I realized I was capable of making money, I was able to make decisions for myself that were very different than decisions that I would have made had I had my mother's life or my grandmother's life. So that changed everything. And I knew if it happened to me, it could happen out there as well. Absolutely. I love that. So, okay, now back to your model of how this works for the so artisan. The, yeah, the model is a little different for everyone. So what we teach, we, um, we are beyond fair trade. Fair trade principles are fabulous, but they're about 60 years old. They haven't changed in a really long time. So fair trade would say children aren't exploited. We would say girls have to stay in school. Mm, so one it's step a more. whole level up above fair trade. So one of the fair trade models is that we you know, the artisans don't have to borrow money because we, we bring orders to the table. You bring orders into the village. And we are able to prepay for part of those orders. And so they have the money from those orders to develop the product and to make the product. And then we pay for all the shipping to get it to us. All they have to do is kind of get it to the DHL office. And that's all shipped then into us. And then we're able to check it, correct it, if there's quality control issues, train the artisans better or anything like that. There's a tremendous amount of training. We still have the nonprofit and we have the for-profit. And the nonprofit works with us and others to help develop training modules and to help scale the artisans. And then you, right now, you are selling Bajalia, the artisans, treasures, where? We are selling them through wholesalers and retailers. We're wholesaling and retailing. We are retailing on our own website, bajaya.com. We are also retailing on domino.com. We're retailing on Overstock. We have an HSN business. We sell on Home Shopping Network and we sell on HSN. 
We also have some international distributors. So you handle that part. And what I what you what you bring into the village is a prepayment for orders. Yeah, not and not long term. So here's our goal, and this is one of the problems with the fair trade model. The fair trade model would keep the artisans where you're prepaying, but the reality is, if you're bringing the artisans consistent orders, they should cycle out of that. That's not how a business works long term, right? right. None <laughs> no of my clients give us. me fifty percent. Nobody prepays me, right? So what we try to do is get the artisans started, get them cycling cash, and then we reduce the 50% to 30%. And then we reduce it to where they're funding their own orders. So amazing. So it's really important. And that's something Those that doesn't just... really exist in a lot of the fair trade world. I feel like some of the models that are out there are keeping the artisans dependent. Yeah. And I believe it's really important that we create an interdependence, yeah. that we really empower them to work with people other than us because everyone's not going to work this way. Right. So what are some of the biggest transformations you've seen in the villages? Oh, it's, so, it's so amazing. I mean, we're, we're monitoring the transformation. Um, women are, we, in this one village we worked in, I took a photograph of a woman that just was really just a piercing, wonderful photograph. And we used it on a publication, on a, on, a, on a marketing piece. We took some of those pieces to her in the village. And we said, hey, we wanted you to have your picture. It was printed. I don't believe she'd ever seen a picture of herself printed. No one else in the village had either. She got promoted to be the village elder, the leader of the village, because she had this piece of paper printed with her picture on it. And everyone thought she was the most important thing in the world. It's it's amazing what can happen when someone is elevated to mm. that scale. She became the village leader, the Sanjput of the village, which is a really big deal. Um, we have seen daughters get put into school. We, we now have, I've been in here, I've been working at this 12 years. I've got some of my first daughters, I've got them going on to higher education. They're in college. They're in, some of them are getting degrees in fine art. They're changing everything. And I've been working long enough now that the next generation has taken over. So a huge part of our workforce now overseas, the people leading our, our groups, most of them are under 30 now. They're the children of our artisans are starting. They're yeah. technology friendly. Wow. That's what I was saying. Impact. It's so generational different. impact. It's huge generational impact. And it's so different than when I was working before. I mean, everyone is on, I, I was kidding, my last tour of India was the WhatsApp tour, because <laughs> everybody's on WhatsApp but me, and I had to get on it. But between Facebook and WhatsApp, and I mean, I actually just had a conversation with Randy Zuckerberg, Mark's sister, and said, okay, you cannot imagine how my work has changed because of what y'all have done. It's amazing. Right. Everything is different for us now. And this is not, how we work today is not how I worked 12 years ago, 13, 14 years ago. Right, and it's just evolving fast, fast. And even in my office, 90% of my office is under 25 or 30. Right. So everything is changing at a, I mean, just at a really rapid pace right now in the industry. So we have this model of transformation, that, and you've been really resilient and staying at it. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the challenges Talk to me about a couple of the big challenges or tough things on the other side, making this work as a social entrepreneur. You know, um, I think that, I know we'd like to call them challenges, but it's just life. It's just life. I don't use the word challenges. I don't use the word crisis. I don't use the word, it's just part of work. Every single job has things that you have to be a strategic problem solver to solve and so to get past. what have been your, have you had a really tough moment that you share with us? I've had a million really tough moments. That you got through? I mean, I've had, you know, we're a fast growing business right now. Um, when I, I remember when I first went to HSN and they're like, wait a minute, you want to bring product from remote villages all over the world and get them on HSN and pass our QA and pass our standards and ship them? And I'm like, yeah. Like, how do you think you can do this? And I said, because I started as a nonprofit. I've tested everything. We, we, we've, we've really gotten to a place. I, I thought I was ready, and I was as ready as I knew I could be at that moment, because I, I didn't know what I didn't know, and you never do. 
but you know, I, well, some of our toughest moments were that very first HSN show. I remember being in the lobby, talking to our buyers saying, I'm so sorry, we had two products that didn't show up, like two items out of like 30 didn't make our first show. And I, she said, Debbie, do you know how many people don't make their first show at all? The whole thing doesn't show up. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so I really felt like our artisans had really like hit this bar, amazing bar. So, you know, every single time we get to a new level, there's a lot of new challenges we have to figure out. Um, I would say one of our biggest challenges has been funding our growth. The amount of money of venture capital that actually goes to women-owned businesses is less than 3%. And less than... 2% of women-owned businesses ever go over a million dollars in sales. Yes, I see. And that's that because statistic. they can't get funding, right? So it's a cycle. So I've been fortunate to be able to um, cultivate an investment partner for some of the growth, but it's not enough because we you... have more opportunities than we can, can go after right now. So if you were speaking to giving w women advice that need to go raise capital... What are three or four things you would tell them? You know, I would say try to work your immediate network first and leave no stone unturned. Um, follow the warm trail. Someone's always going to tell you about somebody. The man that's my biggest investment partner now, I didn't know five years ago. I never had met him. Um, and he's one of my dearest friends now. And he's my biggest um, supporter. But you never know where the money's going to come from. So don't be afraid to ask for it. But when you do ask for it, be prepared. Uh, if you can bootstrap as long as possible to bring money in, I would say do that. Bring as much money in as you can bootstrapping. And that's so important because? It's so important because you don't have to give up as much of the company when you do ask for money. Because that's the biggest challenge. If you have a great company and you have a good income potential, you know, one of my big challenges was when everything crashed in 2008 and 2009, even the nonprofit had struggles because that 40% income or 30% income we still were getting as donations stopped. So we had to really regroup and quickly and think, okay, what direction are we going to go in? We decided to go ahead and launch the for-profit at that moment, but the way we launched that was hoping to get a large client. Well, we got the large client, but getting the money to fund the large client the cash was flow a to whole get. nother story. So bootstrapping as long as you possibly can, but also at the point that you can't, admit it and be willing to give up what you have to give up to keep your company afloat and keep it equity. alive and keep it going. Because a small percentage of a $10 million company is better than... 80% of a $1 million company, right? Right. So just be realistic in what you're keeping and why you're keeping it. If you're just holding on to it to be the boss, that's not a good enough reason. Right. Um, you'll find strategic partners along the way. I also think I didn't do this enough. I think I should have now, looking back. I didn't enter enough awards and enter enough um, You've been winning things right and left lately. Right now I have, but... But I didn't, enter, I didn't enter pitch competitions, and I didn't enter all these things where I could have won 10000 here and 20000 there, 50000 here. I didn't do that. I was really busy running the company. Um, I would have done more of that had I realized it, because that's free money. Yeah. I mean, the best way to get money is free. Like win a contest. Win some contests. Get free money. Um, and so that really is something I didn't take advantage of, and I would have done that differently. Well, on that note, what advice would you give your younger self? You know, I, um, I, I grew up in an Arab culture that didn't have many hopes for me. Mm. I was going to marry one of my cousins, and I was going to have a bunch of babies, and I was going to live in the same town my family has lived in, you know, since the 40s. So, you know, when I think about the dreams I would have had for myself, I would have probably told myself to dream more, mm. to dream more and to plan bigger because no one's more surprised than I am of where I am right now. But I had a few dreams that I was afraid to speak, 
But I don't think I ever let myself really dream as big as I could have dreamt as a child, wow. mostly for the world that I was being raised in, you know. And then I had some um, abuse issues as a child and some other issues that really kept me thinking a little smaller than yeah. I think I, w I should have been thinking. Yeah. And I was always extremely talented. I always was creative. That's the one thing my family recognized in me that my creativity and but no one thought to put me in you know art school or design school because when it came time for me to get educated my father said that a girl didn't need an education so I had to work full-time and put myself through school at night so I could get educated because I had two brothers that were already in college and my dad couldn't put all three of us so his answer was I didn't need it um, fortunately, many, many years later, he apologized to me for that and said, you know, I so wish I would have done things differently, but you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And that's so graceful of you. And he came you. from a culture that that's not what they did. Right. Right. He, he was born in the Middle East. He was born in Ramallah. In that culture, there just wasn't, that wasn't how it was done. Right. So he was a product of his culture and his environment. And that's how I can be really forgiving around the world. And graceful, when we work I with see. Men. You're working with women who could have been you. Exactly. Well, and, the, and their fathers could have been mine. So I look at how they're being treated, and I look at things that are happening, and their fathers don't know better either, right? They don't know the difference either, just like my father didn't know the difference. So turning a culture has, happens one woman at a time. I one job that. at a time. And the amount of compassion and empathy you're bringing instead of this level as, right, a child of abuse, you could have held a lot of anger, right? This could be manifesting different in your life. It could But it's have. like in this beautiful, but, like, liberating of other women. You know, they say that your pain drives your biggest passion, and I find that's really true of me. I think that if you let your pain have power... Um, I think that it really would manifest itself differently. Mm. My pain, the only power it has is for good. It doesn't have any power to destroy my life. Now, that hasn't always been my story. That has not always been where I've lived and breathed, but it is today. How, and it's been a transition. How has that journey, I know, how has your faith informed this journey of yours and your business? My faith is um, a huge part of what I do. I am a woman of faith, um, and I, I believe I have to be. I tell people all the time when they come to work for my company, if faith makes you uncomfortable, this is the wrong place for you because you're going to see God's miracles every day. Mm -hmm. It is a miracle every day that we're doing what we're doing with some of the poorest women in the world. And I believe if I didn't have my faith, I would somehow believe this was all up to me. And I would somehow believe I had all this power to do these things. And it would paralyze me. It's, it would be so overwhelming. It's, when I went into a I country and saw the pain, I would be like, oh my gosh, I have to fix this. But I don't have to fix this. All I have to do is follow the path God's laid out for me. Mm. I have to follow my path and I have to do my part. And that is liberating. That is freeing because it's not my problem. I can go and say, okay, God, you got a problem here. This does not look like it's supposed to look. we got to fix this. And I'm ready you're going to have to right? tell me what to do because I have no clue. And, you know, if you ask those kind of questions, it will unfold for you. The next mm. steps will unfold. The peace will unfold. The, the questioning will begin. You'll have divine ideas and divine revelations. I think when you know it's not up to you, you open your mind up to getting all of that input and download from, you know, that authority that cares more about these women than I do, yeah. cares more about these little girls than I do. I was just reading When Breath Becomes Air by the 36-year-old neurosurgeon who passed away, but he was talking about this idea of coming to grips with something that's so much more benevolent than even he could be as a neurosurgeon, and that like being at the end of himself and finding something much grander I think as a description of case. God, right? Like, like something much bigger. How do you, 
you're a woman that's traveling around the world. You're from an Arab. You're an Arab. You're a believer. What do you? What? What is your feeling about this tension between religions right now and just seemingly increasing div divisiveness in our culture and inability to be with people's otherness? You know. Um it is a very tough world we're living in right now, and I, I strongly believe that, you know, and, and I work with the Department of State on, on some of these issues, and women, um, where women are employed, where women are educated, terrorism does not exist. This instability in our world right now has everything to do with the fact that women are not being employed in some of the poorest places in the world. If we look at the refugee crisis, the humanitarian crisis, if we look at terrorism, terrorism does not exist where girls are educated and where women are being employed. That's a huge game changer. I mean, just hold some space around that. Say that again. Terrorism ceases to exist where women are employed and where girls are being educated, right? And that's, that's like, so, and even the statistics. So if you look at the um, GDP, when aid goes into a country, the GDP goes down and violence to women goes up. There's a direct correlation in a low GDP and violence to women. So jobs change everything. Everything changes when women get money in their hands and 90% of their money goes to the betterment of their community. Women don't get a job and just help themselves. They help their neighbor, they help their brother, they help this. I their have a children. lot of women that are employing male members of their family to help them. And in a lot of countries they have to because they can't do everything. But when you look at the numbers, I, we work with the Department of State on some of these issues and someone from the Department of State said to me one day, he said, Debbie, I love putting hands, money in the hands of your women because it takes the guns out of the hands of our children. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, it does. So we'll get to a more peaceful world as we continue to steward our responsibility to girls and women around the world. Absolutely. I believe that strongly. I believe it wholeheartedly. I believe it's the only answer to some of the crisis issues we're happen having around the world. And I also believe all governments have to work together towards this goal. You know, I, I know that um, I heard a quote, Bill Gates was speaking in Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia asked him, and they said, do you think our country will become like this technology powerhouse? And he said, never, not as long as you're leaving 50% of the best minds in your country behind. Mm. We're not going to get to where we need to be if we are leaving women at the table, if not, we're not inviting women to the table, you know, and that's not okay. Right. So that really will bring us a more peaceful world. Unfortunately, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And, but if you look at places like Liberia, that women came in and solved the crisis and saw and brought peace to Liberia from all of the violence there. Women are the ones that came to the table and did that. We are seeing story after story after story of women stepping up. So when you think of, um, when you're thinking of social entrepreneurs, how do you define a social entrepreneur and what do you feel like we, how can we can equip people? You know, I like, um, I like uh, Bill Drayton with Ashoka. I like his definition of a social entrepreneur. He's like, you know, a social entrepreneur is not there to teach someone to fish. They're there to revolutionize the fishing industry. So I believe social entrepreneurs are the ones that are going to bring the, the, the most revolutionary, most um, world-changing ideas to the table. And I believe there's not enough support for entrepreneurs right now in our country as it is. What would you like to see? You know, I'd like to see some women angel venture groups. I'd like to see women. Um, we, we've got a major interesting period in our country right now. We're going to have a distribution of wealth that's going to change pretty dramatically. So 
everyone says, oh, the distribution is going to go into the hands of the younger generation, and the younger generation is going to be much more interested in social enterprise. But before that happens, money is going to change hands to women before it hits that generation. So women are going to, I believe, there's going to be a gender transfer of wealth before there's a generational transfer of wealth, right? Parents aren't going to die on the same day. Right. Most likely the male is going to go first, and then his wife is going to inherit everything prior to transferring it to her, the children. So we've got a major gender transfer of wealth happening, and women have completely been unprepared for this. Wow. Women are not prepared to do the things necessary to invest that wealth or to think. But it has been proven that when women are in that position, they will think about the things that matter to their hearts more. Yeah. And education for women, education for girls, women businesses, social enterprise are going to be on the top of that list. What skills do we need to equip young people with so they can run their own businesses and change the world? I personally think the more we can equip people with strategic problem solving, 99% of what I do every day is strategic problem solving. I mean, there, my desk is the problem desk. Everybody in my office is hitting my desk with, we have this, we have this, we have this problem, we have this crisis. You know, 90% of entrepreneurship is problem solving. About, I'd say 10% is, you know, your network and marketing and generating your network and doing that. The other percentage is, how well you persevere through problems. Wow, how right? well you persevere through problems. So on that stay there, you're talking to someone that's out there, they're stuck, they feel like giving up, or they feel like they're not gonna be able to do this, maybe under-resourced, whatever. What are three pieces of advice you'd give? You know, I'd say the first thing, I love Seth Godin's book about whether you're in a cul-de-sac, a dip or a cul-de-sac, yeah, you know, yeah, right? Yeah, right? I'd say you better know that. Yeah, is this a so dip or is this a One of the things I do, every time I'm in this crisis place, I'm like, okay, this bad thing is happening, but what's what good is happening? And I kind of make a list of all the other things that are going on around me that are good. And that makes me know chart. I'm in a dip. I'm not in a cul-de-sac, right? I'm in a dip. This is like, wait a minute, all this good stuff is happening and then this negative thing is happening? Just on the other side of that is going to be success. Yeah. So I really try to identify when I have a crisis or a challenge or a problem to solve. Is this a, a, a dead end? Or is, this, is it something that's going to cause me to pivot? Or are there all these good things still happening and this is just one thing I have to solve and resolve? So that's the one thing. I'd say know where you are. Know where you are. Know where you are in that. I'd say the second thing is have a really strong um, set or, or group of mentors around you. Somebody that, even if they don't know anything yes. about your business, they can cheerlead you on. They can remind you of, you know, because I look now and I think, you know, one of the things I, I laugh about is I keep this list. It's stones of remembrance. It's like, I remember when, you know, that was our biggest problem. You know, I remember when I didn't have $1,000 in the bank. Now, then it was, I don't have 10000 in the bank. Now it's, I don't have 100000 in the bank. You know, there's a problem. You know, there, you're getting to a new place and new problems. And I would say, remember where you've been so you can see the future. Don't forget all of the successes along the way. Mm. I think you should celebrate them. Don't forget them. And when things get tough, go back and revisit those successes so you can remind yourself where you are and where you've been. Because I think it's really important. I think the world, the world is not for entrepreneurs. I would say more people told me to quit the first six months or year when I wasn't profitable than ever. I said the world is afraid of entrepreneurs. They're afraid of people that risk everything. They're afraid of people that are willing to cash out their last dollar in their 401k. They're afraid of that. It, this living on the edge, this thing that we do as an entrepreneur, that's not how, that's not the safe way to live. And the world wants us to be safe because they can put us in a box. And I would say that, you know, when all of that criticism when all of that naysaying, when all of those bullies come along and try to push you away from 
your goal. Your assignment, your call, your be mission. Be strong enough to know that you know that you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, even if it doesn't pay off. You know, I really had to get to that place. I had to say, okay, I know that if I only employ three women, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. If I'm employing 3,000, great. If I'm employing 30,000, great. But if I change a life of one woman, that's got to be enough for me. That is such a strong statement because I got a... I, left the school this week and I got a note from one of my students that said at the very bottom it said I know you want to inspire and resource a hundred million people and they said but remember if you can touch one life the way you've touched mine you have been a success That's and I felt you know guilt and overwhelm emotion at that moment of being reminded by someone I'm mentoring. It's about the one. It's about the one. It really is about, and life is about the one. And, it, and it, you could have a lot of ones. And I'm fortunate that I just, left, I just got back from India and I was able to take two people with me that had never seen our work before up close and personal. And I was in awe of their analysis of our work. But even if that wasn't true, even if I changed one woman's life, I think that's got to be enough, Pam, right? Mm. We have to be willing to say, maybe I'm not here to change the world. Maybe I'm here to change her mm. or to help her. And I think that's important. I, I think that we get caught up in numbers yes. and we get start playing a numbers game and we start getting distracted and dissatisfied. And the reality is... My life was changed because one person gave me a job at 14 years old. Yeah. One person And then look in me. at the exponential impact of that job. Right? One look person at the believed jobs in me. You're stewarding. Right. And, and so if I look at that, I don't know what else that person has done in his life, but I know that my work now is a result of him believing in me. So on that note, how do you define success? I don't think about it a lot. For you, what is the definition of success? I don't success? even know. Is it the one? You know, I think success at the end of the day is more personal. It's more mm. about me. I don't think it's an outward, an outward thing. I think it's an inward thing. If I feel like I am a good steward of every single thing that's brought in my life, that is every person, every soul, every spirit, every dollar, I believe I'm successful. And that's whether I have a little or whether I have a lot. I think if you can be content and joyful with what God gives you to work with on any given day, I think that's success. I don't think it's an, a huge overarching business plan or a financial statement. I just think that's just adding confusion to the equation. But what are your every spirit, day what are spiritual, good. what do you do to stay that centered? What do I do to stay the centered? Um, you know, I, I do a daily uh, quiet time meditation. I journal every day. Um, I write out, uh, I, I, many years ago, I did something called The Artist's Way. Yes, Julia I Cameron. I love The Artist's Way. I love and, her. Um, and, it talked about three pages of morning uncentered, pages. Uh, un, you know, unfiltered journaling. And I do, I do, I have a prayer journal. I have a gratitude, I, I do gratitude. I am grateful every day for things. And I think that, and, and I just unfiltered, dump things out daily. Um, I have to because my... My job relies on ultimate creativity. I have to be really on and creative every day. I have to have great ideas for products and great ideas for business ideas and great ideas for our infrastructure and how to figure things out in three different countries and any given breakfast morning. You know, I wake up every morning and have hundreds of emails because everybody is working when I'm asleep. So if I don't take that time in the morning, I can get really into this chaos mm. of my day. So I am very committed to that time. Mm. Um, I'm committed to listening to music that lifts me up and music that raises um, 
my energy level to really focus on a bigger picture. Um, and I try to keep the good stories of the things we do around us, whether I share them with my team at a team meeting, whether I have a photograph sitting over my desk, whether I have photographs in our lobby, I try to remind myself of the work that we're doing every day yeah. so that I can remember what I'm there for. Because you can get caught up in the junk, right? You can get caught up in the bank called and this called or so-and-so, you know, DHL, All the details DHL of the has mission. a package stuck, right? You know, the details that are so far All from the, the purpose. All the details are so far from the purpose. So we try to, I try to keep my purpose and the faces that I work for and the reasons that I do what I do, mm. I try to keep them up close and personal and make it be about them and mm -hmm. not about me, mm -hmm. right? Because the minute that you transfer and it's about you, then you're easily offended. Then you're easily um, manipulated. Then you're, you're easily angered, right? Right. But if you keep it about the things that it's about. Yeah, the people that you got into it to serve. Right? Yeah. Right? Then, and every day I feel like I am served so much more mm. than, than, you know. It's th that, right, that spiritual principle that when yeah. you give, you receive, and that there's some kind of magical endorphin there thing that was and just. Sowing. There is a There is, you sow what you reap, and, and you reap what you sow. And um, I just, just an example of that, just this week, you know, Facebook is the ultimate equalizer all over the world. And so I was talking to, um, I posted something uh, this past week about our India trip or something. And one by one, different people we visited in India were just commenting on how grateful they were for our work or how grateful they were for our visit or how we're changing their lives. I mean, I saw one person while I was in India and he said, we were going under before we met you and before mm. you changed everything about us. And his, he runs a business with twin sisters and these twin sisters were amazing. They were telling me, I said, what is your dream for your business? And the, the sisters, um, one of them Humaira and one of them Aisha, and they said to me, you know, we had to drive an hour and a half away to go out of our village into the nearest city to get higher education. They're both college educated, which is extremely rare in this part of India. And they said, we had to drive an hour away to do that. Our dream is that other girls in this village don't have to. Mm. That we can grow a business where we can further educate all the women that work for us. Wow. And I was like, that's yeah. what it's about, right? How do you stay centered? You focus on everybody else instead of yourself. Oh, perfect. So as we start to wrap up, up um, is there anything else you'd like to say to makers or creators or starters? You know, I love, I'm a maker. I've always been a maker. I was making my own Barbie dresses at five years old. I said to someone when I was a little, when I was a very little girl, I said, when I grow up, I'm gonna be a designer and travel all over the world. <laughs> I didn't even know what the world was at the time that I said that, but I would say don't lose your dream, mm -hmm. whatever that dream is, but be willing that it l might look differently than you thought, right? When I thought of originally the idea of Bajayat, I was going to go live in a foreign country, sit with six women in a village and embroider and, and help them. That was this the is, initial idea. That was the first thought was I need to help these girls, right? I need to help them. Um, it doesn't look anything like that now. I still would love to live overseas. I still would love to sit in a village and, and embroider for weeks at a time. That's not the life I have now. But be willing to allow that dream to manifest mm. itself into something even bigger and greater than you ever imagined. But also be willing, if it is embroidering with six women in a village, that you're content with that too. Right. Right? How powerful. So where do we find you online, on social? Everywhere. At? We are at bajalia.com. And that's B A J A L I A. So we're at bajalia.com. Um, I'm debbiefarah.com as well. 
Um, we are on Twitter. We are on Facebook. We are on Pinterest. We are on Instagram. You can find us everywhere and you will see the most amazing faces and the most beautiful product created by the most beautiful people. Yes, yeah, so whatever the next holiday is in some woman's life that you know, go to bajalia.com. Give, can, right? Right. The gift that keeps giving. And as I sit here and get ready to wrap up, just this thought. And we do also have a very exclusive collection on hsn.com. Uh, and on hsn.com. As I sit here and think about this dream bigger and dream, hold on to that dream. How powerful is that, right? Uh, isn't that fun? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You are Kim. a rock star. You're a rock star too. Thank you.